Hello. Cool. So um, I work for Oracle, and Oracle has a, a managed Kubernetes offering. And uh, a little while ago, I was given the, the job of looking at replacing the networking layer, which was Flannel, with some features of the, the Oracle cloud. And uh, that all sounded really good. Uh, and I started digging into it, and I soon realized that I didn't really understand how Flannel worked. And uh, it kind of seemed wrong to replace one thing with another thing if you don't understand the thing you're replacing. So uh, I, I kind of dug into it a bit deeper. And after a while, it became apparent that I didn't really understand any of this networking stuff at all. So um, yeah, so long story short, went down a big rabbit hole, learned some stuff. But more importantly, I kind of realized I really enjoyed this stuff. So um, I thought I'd write a talk and come and spread the networking love a little bit. So uh, yeah, my name's Chris. In the next uh, 30 minutes or so, I'm going to try and explain how a container on one machine can get can connect to a container on another machine and what the various mechanisms are to allow you to do that. Uh, yes, yeah, so if you already know this stuff, now is your time to leave. Uh, cool, so first of all, we need to know what we're aiming at. So we're going to, well, go with the Kubernetes model because well, it's KubeCon and all. So um, basically, for a network layer in Kubernetes to, to be compliant, it needs to follow these three rules. But what that really boils down to is every, every pod in the cluster has its own unique IP address. And um, each one of those needs to be able to talk to each other just using that IP address, and there's no address translation in between. And also, uh, pods need to be able to talk to nodes, and nodes to be able to talk to pods. That's it. So that's what we're trying to work towards. And uh, how are we going to do this? So we are going to uh, get there in kind of four steps. And for each of these steps, uh, I'm going to show a kind of rather badly hand-drawn diagram and talk about that a bit. And then I'm going to uh, show some code in, in Bash. And everybody loves Bash, so that's good. And then I am going to run that code. And then we can get in and sort of you know, capture some packets and ping some interfaces and things and see how it all hangs together. So the four steps are, are as follows. First of all, I'm going to look at uh, the simplest possible thing, just a node with a network namespace, and look at how that can connect to the node. Uh, the next step, we're going to stay on the one node, but have two network namespaces, and look at how you can connect, send packets between them. Next step, move out to two nodes, and then look at how the packets go between the two nodes and containers, but in this case, just on the same L2 network. And then finally, the kind of more general case is two nodes separated across different networks. And we'll see how that works. So let's get going. So this is the, um, the simple case. So we've got the big diagram, uh, the big uh, rectangle on, on the outside. So that represents the node. So that could be a, a bare metal machine, or it could be a VM. Kind of doesn't really matter. That's got an interface. Here it's rather confusingly called EMP0S8, but it just treat it as E0. It's only called that because that's what the virtual box uh, called it. Uh, it has an IP address, 10.0.0.10. And then the little box in the middle, which I've named, labeled con, well, that represents the container. So Maybe we should just take a step back a bit. So a container in Linux is, is a process with a bunch of mechanisms, Linux mechanisms, to kind of isolate that. And, uh, and these include C groups and namespaces and various security things. But from the point of view of network connectivity, the only thing that really matters is the network namespace. So um, when I say container from now onwards, really what I'm just talking about is network namespaces here. Um, Yes, so what we need to do, well, actually, first of all, what is a network namespace? So the way I see that is it's kind of separate instance of the kernel networking stack, well, another instance. So that would involve three things. So you've got extra interfaces, a separate list of interfaces. You've got a separate list of IP, uh, IP tables rules and a separate list of routing rules. So if you go into a, a network namespace and type IF config, you'll see one list of interfaces. Do that on the host, on, in the default namespace, you'll see a different list. So there are the kind of things we've got to kind of play with to wire these things together. So the first thing is, how do we get connectivity between the network namespace and the host? And the way we do this is we have a, a user thing called a VETH pair. So that is a kind of Linux networking construct. I kind of visualize it as a, a sort of Ethernet cable with an interface card at either end. So it's a point-to-point -point thing, put packets one end, they'll come out the other end. And you get one of these ends, and you put it inside the network namespace, and the other end will leave in the default namespace on the host. So uh, that way, we get connectivity between the two. We're given the interface inside the container an IP address, 172.16, so that's a different network than the host. And uh, the final piece of the puzzle here is to set up some routing rules. 
So on the host, we have quite a simple routing rule. That's basically saying if you want to go to that IP address, 172.16.0, send it straight to that VEF1 interface. And then the routing rule inside the container, well, there's only really one interface, and there's nowhere else it can go, so we just need one default rule which just routes everything back out again. And it kind of looks a little bit confusing because we're, we're saying the gateway is, well, we are the gateway in this case. Uh, but yeah, it works this way. So that is the setup. So what we're going to do now is try and um, have a look at what this looks like in code. Can you see this OK? Cool. So I'm running in a different, uh, a new virtual box, a new virtual machine here. And uh, here's some code which will, when we run it, will set up this, this model. And uh, I say it's bash. It's not really. It's just lots of calls to the same command. So here I'm using the IP command. And that is kind of, uh, well, it's, it's kind of the only one you really need to know in order to set up any of this networking stuff. It, it kind of subsumes the older IF config and root and things. So uh, I'm not going to go through every line of this, um, uh, of this file, because that will take a while. But I just wanted to give you a kind of flavor of what it might look like. But basically, we go through and, and set up all the bits in that diagram. So we create the namespace. We create the VEF pair. We put one end of the VEF pair into the namespace. We enable. We bring up the interface. Bring up the interface on the node. Set the loop back in there. We don't really need to do that, but I've done it anyway. Uh, and then we set up the root, both on the node and in the namespace. So let's give it a go, see if it works. So now I'm going to run that. So the first thing we can do is let's ns. Uh, so there, we're just listing the network namespaces, and that's the one we just created. So now let's have a look at the interface inside the namespace. So here I'm doing a net ns exec. So you can kind of think of this as a bit like Docker exec or kube controlled exec, or you know, kind of going into namespace and running a command in there. Uh, and there you can see the, the bottom one is the v2 interface. So that's the one we created. And then let's see if we can ping it from the node. Cool. So that kind of seems to work. So that means we've got connectivity going both ways, uh, which is good. And uh, so, yeah, one question we could ask is, what is actually responding to this? Because normally when you think about containers, you're thinking about a process which is in a container, and that's the thing that's kind of you're talking to. But in this case, I haven't put any process. I've just created a namespace. Uh, so I'm sending ping requests, ICMP packets, in. And it's, an, it's the, the kernel stack inside the namespace that is responding with the, the response, the ICMP responses. So I guess if we wanted to set up a more kind of realistic example, we might uh, want to start a process inside there and talk to that. But from the point of view of just investigating the connectivity, we kind of don't need to. So I'm just going to do it this way because it's easier. Um, yeah. So next step, oh, wrong way, is to move on to uh, the case where we have two namespaces on a single node. So here, it kind of looks similar. So we've got the big node on the outside. We've got each container. There are separate network namespaces uh, given different IP addresses here. So one is 0 0.2, one is 0 0.3, con1 and con2. Uh, the v pairs are exactly the same. Uh, the thing that's different in this case is that uh, rectangular box in the middle. And that's the way we achieve connectivity between them. And this is a, a Linux bridge. So again, just like the ETH pairs, this is a kind of Linux networking construct which you can create with the IP link command. And so I've created one here, called it BR0, and I've given it an IP address. So I guess you don't really need to give it an IP address. Uh, if I didn't, then you'd still be able to route packets between the two containers, but there'd be no way off of that bridge onto the host and ultimately out onto other machines. So by giving it an IP address here, it kind of becomes a gateway to that little network, that little subnet. And this is kind of the way that Docker works by default. If you just install Docker, it, it creates a Docker zero bridge, which is exactly like this. So the final piece of the puzzle here are the, the two uh, the routes that we have to set up. So on the node, we've got uh, a slash 24 range. So I'm assigning all the IPs in that slash 24 range to uh, all of the containers that are hanging off the bridge. Uh, that means I can have 254, I guess, of them. Uh, so anything in that range will get routed to the bridge. And then from inside the container, we have, uh, so the bottom rule there is saying anything in that range, just send it directly out the VEF 
21 interface. So that's a directly connected network, directly connected route. Uh, and if it's not that, then use the default route. And the default route is saying use the bridge IP address as the gateway. So that would route it out to the bridge, and then when it gets out to the host, well, that would have to look at its routing tables to kind of forward it on to wherever it's, gonna, wherever it's destined for. Cool. So let's move on. So here we got, uh, rather like before, we've got a, um, a kind of clean virtual machine. So let's have a quick look at the code to set this up. So as you might expect, it's, it's kind of similar to uh, what it was last time, but there's two of everything. Uh, so again, I'm not going to go through each step because it's basically the same as before. Uh, the key point here is the line, what was that, 26. So that's where we're creating the bridge. So as I said, you can use the IP link command and you can um, uh, create a link, call it BR0, and it's of type bridge. And then we have to, we assign an IP address to it a little bit lower on sort of line 33, and then we enable the bridge and we're all good to go. So. Right, so what can we do? So we can look at the interfaces on the, on the node now, and we can see the bridge is the one at the bottom here, and it has the IP address 16.0.1. Uh, maybe let's get inside of one of the containers and see if we can ping the other container. So I am execing into COM1, which is the container on the left, the network namespace on the left. Uh, and I'm going to ping the one on the right. So this is looking good. It means we got connectivity both ways. All good. Uh, actually, one thing worth mentioning here is that value of the, the TTL. So the, the, the TTL is um, the time to live of the packet, and that gets, it's just a number, and it gets decremented each time a packet gets routed. Uh, it starts at 64, so in this case, it hasn't been routed at all, because it's just come out one interface onto the bridge, straight back in, so there's been no routing going on, it's just a single Ethernet packet going around the bridge. I'll only mention it now, because in the next section, we'll see this changing, and it might make more sense then. Uh, also kind of proves that I'm not you know, pulling the wool over your eyes or something. Uh, Oh, and finally, yeah, we can just check out. So from inside the container, let's make sure we can talk to the node itself. And again, that's good. So that means we've got ICMP packets going in and out. So we've got connectivity both ways. Right. So let's move on to the third step. Oh, no. Uh, and so now we're getting, we're kind of doubling up again, almost. So this is the case, the key point about this case is both of these nodes are on the same uh, layer two network. So they're just connected by a switch here. So the node on the left has a 10.0.0.10, node on the right, 10.0.20, they're in the same subnet. Um, otherwise, they're much the same. So each one is the same as the one before. We've got two containers in each, connected with these pairs, got a bridge on each, all looking good. So what we need to understand, well, what I'm aiming to get across here is how you can get packets from one container on one node to a container on a different node. And the trick in this point is, is really quite simple. There's nothing to it. It's, it's just setting some routing rules on each of the nodes so as they know where to route the packets for the other node. So if you look at, say, the routing rules on the left in the bottom left-hand corner there, we can see uh, the key one is the second one down. So that's saying... Each, for any IP address which is destined for the containers on the right-hand node, send it as a next hop to the node itself, and then the node will know how to route it up into the bridge. Uh, and likewise, we have a corresponding rule on the other node, such that any of the containers in the 0, .0 slash 24 range send it as a next hop to the node on the left, and that will know how to route it up into the bridge. So if you just have a, your Kubernetes cluster on, on a single L2 network, then this becomes quite an easy way of getting connectivity. You don't need overlay networks. You don't need any of that magic. And this is the way some of the, the Kubernetes uh, plugins do it. So there's a, a Flannel has lots of different backends. And one of the backends is a host gateway backend. And that's exactly what this does. It just sets routes on the, on the node. Uh, I think also Calico might behave in a similar manner as well if you're all on the same uh, L2 network. So if you have more than one node, of course, you might have, you'll, you'll have an entry per, 
per node. So you might end up with big routing tables. And you need some way to manage that. So you'll need to, some way to, somewhere to store the range of IPs on one node to the node itself. And that could be etcd, or it could be somewhere else. But we'll get to that a bit later. So let's get back into our demo. So now we've got two clean virtual machines, one on the left, corresponding to the node on the left, one on the right, the other one. So first, let's have a quick look at the code to set up this. Uh, all of this stuff is basically the same as what I um, went through previously. Uh, the key stuff is underneath the little comment down the bottom here. And here, we're setting the route on each node to know how to route to the other node. So I'm going to run this setup script on both VMs, such that you get the routes going both ways. Um, yeah, so it's kind of as simple as that. The final thing we need to do is to enable IP forwarding on the node. So if I didn't do that, Linux by default wouldn't forward packets out. So if it received a packet on its ETH0 and it wasn't destined for the IP address of that interface, it would just chuck it away. And that makes a lot of sense if you've just got a laptop or something. You're not acting as a router. But in our case, we are acting as a router because we're going to get packets coming into the ETH0 destined for one of the containers. So the kernel needs to know to route it onto the bridge. So we have to enable IP forwarding. Cool. So if I run it on that side, run it on that side. So, so first of all, let's have a look at the routes on each side. So on the left-hand side here, you can see the key route is the bottom one. So that's saying any of the IPs in the range 1.0 slash 24, send it to the other node, and there'll be a corresponding route on this side sending it back the other way. So that was what I was saying. That's the kind of trick to get connectivity when you're on the same L2 network. Uh, let's have a quick look. So now let's see if I can ping one of the containers on one node to the other one. So I'm executing into con1 on the left-hand node, and I'm going to ping con1 on the right-hand node. Cool. So it looks like it's, it's working. We've got connectivity both ways. Um, remember I said earlier about the TTL. So in this case, the, the time to live has gone, uh, time to live has gone down by two, which is kind of what you expect because it's been routed twice. So it's been routed once when you, you can't really see it here. So it's been routed once when you come out of the, on the kernel on the left-hand node and routed again going back onto the bridge on the right-hand node, hence the decrement of, of, of two. If I were to do the same, but instead ping the other node, so not going into the container, but going to the node itself, what would happen? Well, it works, but now it's only gone down once, which again is, you know, makes a lot of sense, because it's only been routed on the left-hand node and not on the right-hand node. So, now we get on to step four, which is the, the kind of... The, the more complicated one, and the one I've kind of been building up to because it represents the kind of uh, what I didn't understand in the first place about flannel and overlay networks and things. So, well, I guess before we move on to that, what, what could we do? So if, we, if these two nodes here were on separate L2 networks and that switch in the middle wasn't just one switch, was the internet or other routers and all the kinds of things, then this trick wouldn't, wouldn't work any longer because it wouldn't, the next top wouldn't be on the same network. So one thing you could do is add those routing rules to all the routers in between. And maybe if you control all those routers in between, then, well, maybe that'd be okay. But I suspect that's probably not uh, what most people can do. Another thing you might be able to do is, well, it depends where you're running. If you're running in a cloud environment and, and the cloud provides some sort of root rule capability, so I think Amazon and Google do this, you can assign IP ranges to nodes and then you just do it in the cloud. And that's basically what, what it would do for you then. So again, instead of using any kind of more complicated overlay, you could just assign these root ranges and allow the cloud to root, the, root it for you. But let's assume we can't do that either. So what are we left with? So we are left with using, well, one option is to use an overlay network. <coughs> So in the um, example here, we basically got a, a similar setup, two different nodes, same containers, same bridges, same everything, Q1 
key point, there's a router in between, so we can't pull the same trick that we did in the last step. The one thing that's different is we got this ton zero interface. So this is a, uh, well, this is another, yeah, this is the bit that made me understand the kind of how you can set up these kind of virtual networks. So a ton zero interface is something you can create using the IP tool or a ton interface. And if you just create one, it will show up in ifconfig as an interface, but there's nothing behind it. So normally when you have a network interface, there's some sort of hardware or some virtual NIC or something. But in this case, there's nothing behind it. And uh, so it doesn't seem very useful, but what you can do is put a process behind that. And that process, when you send a packet to the ton device, the process will get that packet, the raw IP packet, and it can do whatever it wants with it. So it could uh, print it to stand it out, or it could you know, send it to the printer and physically print it out if it wanted to. Um, but what we could do is have that uh, process behind it, uh, wrap it in, say, a UDP packet, and send it to a node. And that's exactly what happens in, a, in an overlay network. So you don't need, so the two nodes don't need to know about the separate IP ranges of the containers. They just need to be able to connect via their node addresses. And um, yeah, so we'll go into this in a bit more detail on the next slide. The last thing we need to do here is explain these routing rules. So on the left-hand side, we're saying everything for the, uh, all the containers on my node, just send it to the bridge. The rule beneath it is saying everything for the containers on the other node, send it to the TUN device. And likewise, we've got corresponding routes on the, on the other side. So let's drill in a little bit and have a look at how a packet actually makes it from one container in the top left-hand corner all the way around to a, a container in the top right-hand corner. And um, yeah, so the packet comes out of the container, goes onto the bridge, uh, comes out of the bridge, the kernel will then route it to the TUN device, and we want to set up a process which sits behind that, and it knows, because it can see the IP address, it's got the raw IP packet, it knows which node to send it to. So like I said before, it might look up in a database like etcd or something, and it looks at that mapping, and then it knows where to forward it onto. So in this case, we, we, we're creating, we're wrapping it in a UDP packet, sending it to the other node on port 9000. So it goes out of ETH0, goes through whatever network there is in between, comes back in ETH0 on the, the right-hand node, there's a process sitting there, which is listening on port 9000, which gets that, unwraps it, it's just got the raw IP address, then it sends it back into the TUN device, and when it comes out of that, the kernel will then notice that as the original packet and route it up into the bridge and hopefully to its destination. Yeah. Ah, there's one thing as well. Um, this was, when I did this talk once before, someone asked this question, and I thought it was a really good question. So they basically said, uh, but isn't UDP unreliable? And you kind of, oh, yeah, it kind of stumped me there. But it kind of doesn't matter in this case because we're getting our reliability at a higher level. So it's the TCP stuff on top, or inside, that's what would actually do the retries if this failed. You can actually see, kind of think of the, the UDP connection as a bit like just an ethernet, like sending it on the wire. That's not reliable either, but it doesn't matter because the retries are handed by, handled by the, the layer above. So UDP is okay in this case. And this is exactly how well, the UDP flannel backend works which we'll get to again in a minute. So, right, I guess you're getting it now. It's a similar setup to before. Let's have a look at the code. So again, all this stuff is exa exactly identical to before. Before, if we pop down, we can see the stuff specific to uh, this step. So as before, we have to enable IP forwarding, but the key thing here is we are using SOCAT to set up this tunnel between the two, the two nodes. So if you've not come across SOCAT before, well, I only come across it recently when I was looking at this, because I fully expected to have to write a little process behind this just to set this demo up and do that UDP stuff. And now I come across SOCAT, and it is, it is amazing. So this tool sets up a bi-directional route between two or two endpoints, and those endpoints could be TCP or UDP or standard in or stood out or ton devices. And um, yeah, if you just type man SOCAT, it'll blow your mind, it's amazing. It just does loads of stuff. So there's a lot going on in this. So remember, we're gonna be running this on both sides. And uh, so just this one line is saying, set up a TUN device, give it an IP address, bring that interface up. Behind that TUN device, I want the UDP a process, which is both listening on port 9000. So any packets that come into it, it will receive them and send them to the TUN device. And it's, broad, it's sending stuff out on port 9002 to the other node. So any packets that come from the TUN device, it will send them out of ETH0 onto the other node. And because we're running this the same thing on both sides, we get connectivity between the two. 
Oh, and finally, there's a, yeah, so there's a couple of little, um, well, I say little, other things that you need to do to get this to set up. So when you start dealing with overlay networks, you have to kind of worry about the MTU. So this is a maximum transition unit. And uh, that, ba yeah, so we've got to account for the eight bytes of UDP header. Hence, I'm setting it here to 1492, uh, bumping it down from 1500, which is what it was before. Uh, if we didn't do this, it would probably still work, but if you just got a packet which was just above that bit, it will get fragmented. And that's, well, in this case, it probably wouldn't matter, but in the general scheme, you don't want to do that. Um, so yeah, it's just something you might have to be wary of if you're setting this stuff up yourself. Finally, we got this um, stuff about disabling reverse path filtering. And um, so this is a little, little more subtle. So I, uh, Linux, by default, if you send a packet out of one interface and it receives a response in, on a different interface, it will just drop that. It will consider it as it's kind of suspicious, which kind of makes a lot of sense, really, in general. But in this case, when we're sending a packet from, say, one node to a container on the other node, the packet will go across the TUN device, going up to the container, but on the way back, it will just come straight out of ETH0 and back into the node. Hence, the packet's going out of one interface, coming in on a different interface. Uh, so unless we disable this, in this case anyway, it, it, this demo won't work. I guess there's other ways you could work around this. Maybe you can do some sort of... Um, more complicated routing stuff using kind of source-based routing to ensure that the packet goes over the TUN device, no matter whether it's destined for the node or the container. But uh, yeah, in this case, I've chose to do it this way. So let's have a go at running this stuff. So run it on both. Oh no, it's typical, it didn't work. Have another go. Let's try one more time before I start resorting to uh, videos or something. Yay, it's looking good. <laughs> so, uh, what was I going to do? Yeah, so first of all, let's see if it, you know, if it's connected, see if it actually works. So as before, I'm going to exec into the container on the left-hand node and try and ping the container on the right-hand node. Cool. So that's working. And uh, as before, you can see the TTL has gone down by two, which is what you would expect. It's been routed on both nodes. And, um, and if I ping the node itself, then it should be down to 63. So there, yeah, so that proves we got connectivity. So if we drill in a little deeper now and actually look at what's going on with the packet as it traverses through the, through the, through the various interfaces. So on the one side, I'm going to run this little script, which just pings continuously. So let's set that one going. On the other side, I've got this little script running, which uh, basically, um, given an argument of the interface name, it will uh, do a T-Shark, it will use T-Shark to kind of sniff the packets on that interface. And T-Shark, if you haven't come across it, is like the terminal version of uh, Wireshark. And uh, it's a bit like TCP dump. It's, it's great, great for this kind of stuff. Uh, so first things, let's try and capture the packet coming in sort of through the front door. So this is the EMP0S8. Cool. So. As you can see, the packet's coming in through the front door, but the source and the IP addresses here are of the nodes itself. So this, here you can see the encapsulation in, in, in process. So you don't see anything about the IP source and destinations, the 172 ones of the actual containers. That's invisible. And that stuff is all held within the, the little data section at the end. So you can see it's an Ethernet packet wrapped in an IP packet within the UDP packet, and then the data, which would be the IP packet of the container itself. So now if we stop that, and kind of drill in one level deeper, and we go to the TUN device. Now you can see the packets have been unwrapped, and you can actually see the source and destination IPs of the actual containers itself. And uh, likewise, you can see, just like I said, it's a raw IP packet, and inside of that you can see the ICMP packet, which is the, the ping. And then if we can just drill in one more step, We should see now we're uh, capturing the packets on the bridge on the right-hand node. And you can see it's the same. It's the same source and IP uh, packet, so of the containers themselves. Uh, but you can see now it's been ripped, uh, wrapped in an Ethernet packet. 
So it's been wrapped in Ethernet packets, sent onto the bridge, which again is, is what we'd expect. So that is basically kind of the whole overlay network just kind of you know, patched together in a few lines of bash there. Uh, so what is this? Well, let's have a quick recap first and see what we've done. So we've gone through these four steps. And so the first step was the single network namespace. And the key point there was uh, if you want to connect namespaces to nodes, you can use VETH pairs. And then the second step, if you have more than one network namespace on the same node, we use VETH pairs along with a, a, a bridge. Uh, the third step was the case where we had multiple nodes, but they were on the same L2 network. And that was a kind of easy one where you can just set up some routing rules to just directly hop to the node, the destination node. And then the fourth step is what we just did. And the key point there was you, you can use a ton device to create the overlay network. And uh, a couple of like, key takeaways, at least for me, understanding the different types of routing rules, that was kind of my, you know, my kind of aha moment for understanding this stuff. And, uh, and ton devices, well, they're you know, one of the ways you can, well, it allows all this kind of virtual magic to, to work. And in terms of tools, well, you've got IP for setting all up. You've got SOCAT for just creating bi-directional streams for testing. And then for debugging stuff, you know, TCP dump and T-Shark. Uh, they're your friends. So finally, uh, I just want to kind of bring all this back to sort of real life, I guess, and try and relate it back to some existing stuff that exists out there. Uh, so one of the common um, uh, network solutions for Kubernetes is, is Flannel. And Flannel has a bunch of different backends, and uh, they work in different ways. So one of the backends is the host gateway backend, which exactly corresponds to step three. So that's when you have the, all the nodes on the same L2 network. One of the backends is a UDP backend, which is basically what step four does. Uh, so uh, although it doesn't do it with SOCAT and things, um, it, it's, in essence, it's the same. But that wouldn't be the one that you would typically use in, in production or anything. That's more like a kind of almost like an educational backend, as far as I can tell, maybe debugging. Uh, so what it would really use is VXLAN, and VXLAN is, is an overlay network, it's a UDP thing, but it's implemented in the kernel, and it's, I guess it's more efficient and things. And then we also have these uh, cloud-specific backends. So they set routes in the cloud, which I talked about earlier, so one for Amazon, one for GCE. And uh, oh, and the other thing I want to characterize in these different um, network solutions is where they store their uh, node to pod IP range mappings because they all do it slightly differently. So in the case of Flannel, well, Flannel just stores it in etcd. Uh, there's Calico, that's a, a popular one. Um, there's, I, I believe, you, well, I, all of these things are so configurable, but you can set it up such that there's no overlay for just L2 stuff, so it uses the step three next top routing. Uh, for cross-network stuff, it can use another type of overlay network, which is IP IP encapsulation. Uh, but I, I'm sure you can configure it to use other things too. Um, and in terms of its node to pod subnet mappings, I believe that's done via BGP. So you run BGP agents on your node and they kind of gossip this around. Uh, Weave is a final one or another one. In terms of connectivity, similar to Flannel, so it uses VXLAN, which is the UDP overlay. Uh, but the difference being it doesn't use etcd, I believe it has its pod subnet to node mappings uh, distributed peer to peer somehow. So, that's basically all I've got to say. So all of these scripts and stuff, you can uh, just go onto this um, uh, uh, GitHub page and, um, and grab them and fiddle around and, and send us some comments if, you know, that'd be great. Uh, yeah, any questions? <laughs> got about, about one minute, I think, so. Yep. Uh, why does the Linux kernel on the bridge uh, implement end with their Ethernet protocol? Why does it work? Does it really look like it's not working with their Ethernet Why is that a big back address? Like, why is it doing that? Why is it just not like, wrapped up the IP? Oh, uh, well, I guess it's sort of, well, it is simulating like an L2 switch. So it's, it's kind of using Ethernet packets just as a way a normal physical switch would. Sure, um, Oh, okay, I see. I think they're probably, yeah, you probably don't have to. You could do it other ways, I'm sure. It's just the way it works here.